heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, tech stocks facing headwinds as we head into earnings season. We'll discuss why the sector's 20% rally may be disconnected from reality. Plus a plunge in PC shipments. Apple seeing a 40% drop in shipments as the industry grapples with unsold inventory. We'll bring you the details next. And venture capital firm Eclipse raises $1.2 billion for two new funds, both dedicated to backing startups trying to modernize physical industries. We'll have an exclusive conversation with founding partner Lior Susan. But first, let's check in on these publicly traded markets at the moment. And interesting that we've had a little bit of a flip reverse. I think we just want to go back to the broader markets. Ed, I seem to be jumping the gun and been trying to tell everyone your micro moves. It is a lot about chips. We are seeing a focus on the sales that are happening at the moment in terms of PCs, what that means also for the flood of infantry and chips. But let's just move it on to what's happening in terms of the broader markets if we can. The Nasdaq off by nine tenths of a percent. This is more about the jobs print on Friday, more about the economic fundamentals, more about the Federal Reserve maybe giving us another 25 basis points hike in May. Two year yield up two basis points, so borrowing costs just rising to that all-important 4% level. Bloomberg dollar index on the higher side as we start to price in a more hawkish Fed. Move it on, because what does it mean for the world of crypto? Well, Bitcoin, even amid this dollar strength, Ed, we're still seeing Bitcoin managing to pull up actually more than a percentage point. We're above that 28,000 level. We all eye, of course, what's happening in the world of ETH. Ethereum, we're expecting that upgrade come Wednesday. A lot of volatility likely to come. What about the micro, though? Yeah, when it comes to single movers, the markets in the tech sector are trading what happened Friday because it was a holiday here in the US. Also, you know, kind of thin volumes. Samsung, the world's biggest maker of memory chips, basically said they're going to cut production to meaningful levels, get rid of the supply glut. You see names like Micron and Western Digital trading markedly higher, even though broadly tech is down. TSMC also posting numbers, second consecutive quarterly sales miss, and that is weighing on the US ADRs of TSMC down 3%. The other data point we've woken up to this Monday morning is the IDC PC tracking data. And long story short, Caro, we will get into it later in the show with IDC, a big drop year on year in PC shipments. Apple, certainly the worst, more than 40% drop in its shipments. The stock reacting 2%. Dell also saw a drop, but, but it's a little bit higher, a little more sanguine when it comes to that name. The reason we care is that is not a good leading indicator or foreboding for what's to come in this earnings season around the quarter for those hardware makers, Cara. Yeah, and it is all about now bracing ourselves for the earnings season. What we anticipate, whether or not we can see any real fundamental reason for what is basically a bull market that we've gone back into in the Nasdaq. And it seems as though when you go to the M Live Pulse, this is a great way of getting the Bloomberg user, the people who are managing money, Sentiment. trading these stocks, deciding really whether they're optimistic or not. And ultimately, it feels like they're not particularly. They think only 14%, in fact, think that the earnings right. are going to be strong enough to really vindicate some of the rally we've seen, Ed. The other part that we're looking at with this is the rotation into tech came at the, the expense of the banks, right? Yeah. You think about what happened with SVB. So the question we ask ourselves going forward is, well, that's a little bit artificial because what hurt the banks is also worrying for the tech sector. 41% of re respondents saying what we saw with SVB could spill over mm -hmm. into some of the bigger names. What does that mean going into earnings? What does that mean for the tech sector? Well, we asked our audience, and this is what they've had to say in recent weeks, Karen. The decline in the yields was actually driving tech stocks. And if you take a look at the quintessential central fang men, they peaked at 28% of the S&P. They troughed at around 18 and they've really inched up recently. And that's been because, you know, that discounting mechanism, which is represented by the yield, has resulted in those long tail cash flows being worth more. These tech companies, if we're talking some of the bigger ones, I think they're defensive in the standpoint of the health of their balance sheets. Uh, you can see that when the banking crises un erupted, that even some of the bigger FANG companies actually outperformed on a relative basis because um, essentially their balance sheets are stellar. The cost cutting, once that started to happen, the bottom in tech, in my opinion, was done. And that's why I believe 
there's still another 10 to 15 percent upside in tech. If you look at the seven biggest tech stocks in the U.S., I think they make up almost, you know, up more than 10 percent of the S&P 500 in terms of market cap. And that's only going to grow as people find that the, the, as the only place to hide. But once earnings start to slow down, you should see that uh, you should see this segment start to start. To, you should see their share prices start to fall. A breadth of viewpoints there, Ed. But actually, yeah. what hasn't there been in breadth in is the market rally in the first quarter. It was all down to some of these big tech names. That's why it's so important for the broader market. Right, and you look at the run-up in the Nasdaq 100 the first three months of the, this year, the rotation into tech, it's completely at odds with earnings expectations. Mm. The data shows that we think it's going to be a pretty rubbish season, particularly for mega cap tech. So how do you tally those two things? And also how expensive, therefore, tech has become. 24 times on the Nasdaq 100 in terms of forward earnings. That's more than we've seen over the last decade. Let's get straight to it with, well, the woman who has a few answers for us, Gina Martin-Adams. We're so pleased to say she's coming to us. Of course, you know, our Bloomberg Intelligence. Gina, we are seeing a lot of and worry, basically, how we set ourselves up for the earnings season. People bracing for the numbers to come down and actually, what, the worst since 2006? Yeah, it should be a pretty rough earnings season, not just for tech, but really for the S&P 500 at large. And indeed, it's expected to be a pretty rough first half altogether. Analysts are now forecasting a greater than 7% decline in the first half. Remember, at the beginning of the year, they were expecting only a 2% decline. So in a matter of just a few weeks, analysts' expectations have been plummeting. Tech's a big part of that, both the tech and communication sector, which, of course, houses stocks like Alphabet, and Meta, stocks that we generally think of as tech. Both of those segments of the S&P 500 are anticipated to produce double-digit declines in earnings for the first quarter on the heels of a really rough fourth quarter. So not much good news anticipated to come with the first quarter earnings season. I'd say the only thing that, from a fundamental perspective, may be enabling some better performance from these stocks on the communication side is the valuations are very, very low. This is a group that has been trading off for the better part of a year and a half. So at least on that side of the space where the Googles and the, and the rather Alphabet and Meta, Netflix, Disney's of the world are trading at relative discounts. Uh, so that has emerged. And then also we have seen a tremendous amount of cost cutting. So the consensus is anticipating that within the first half of this year, these companies will prove enough cost cutting, rationalization of expenses and the like that they can produce a margin turnaround by the end of 2023. Gina, we talked about the rotation into tech, the kind of gains in the NASDAQ 100, the sort of starkest example of that. You have mega cap tech in that index. You also have very high multiple software names, some of them pre-profit yeah. as well. Why is there such a, uh, why are they so at odds, the sort of outlook yeah. for a poor earnings season and the performance of that index? Well, I think there's a combination of things going on. The first is, even though outlook, the outlook for earnings is relatively negative, we did price in a very negative outlook for earnings by the end of 2022. Really, as of the early part of October 2022, the market was pricing for a significant decline in earnings to come. We did see the relative momentum and analyst revisions reach a low at that point as well. So even though revisions are still going lower, they're not going lower as fast as they were in the fall of last year. So that has created some degree of stability. I think another thing to consider is at the start of this year, some of these stocks were incredibly discounted. Again, these are the communication segments of tech, not the traditional tech, but the communication stocks were trading at very extreme discounts relative to their long-term uh, history, which would imply they were relatively prepared for very negative earnings news. And then many of these companies came out and announced cost-cutting measures that allowed for the consensus to start to think about a potential margin finally forming for these this segment of the index. And then the last yeah, thing that I would say really did support the rotation was about interest rates. We've seen a pretty big rally in interest rates, which naturally results in improvement in some of the longer duration, higher growth segments of the index uh, in terms of valuation expansion. So it's not been about earnings, really. It's more about a lot of other factors that have helped some near-term recovery in this group. Caroline, you mentioned earlier the valuation question. You know, later in the show, we're going to pass over the IDC data with yeah. IDC. I'm looking forward to that. How much is that a crystal ball yeah. for, the, for the troubled macro environment we're in right now for technology? Yeah, and Gina, to that point, you used to always come on around earnings in the close when I was lucky enough to be in those hours as well. And thinking about when you get that earnings from, for me, the canary in the coal mine was nearly always snap. 
and it was about advertising. But now are we starting to think more about, well, inventory, about consumer, about demand, about yeah. the chip sector? Yeah, and I think this is a really important distinction between, this is why I keep talking about the communication stocks versus the tech stocks. Communication stocks are a different group intentionally because fundamentally they trade on a slightly different cycle. Communication stocks led this downdraft. Remember, that's where you saw a tremendous amount of margin weakness. That's where SNAP was absolutely a good leading indicator. Now we're moving into a slightly different portion of the cycle, which you would expect would probably hammer away at some of the tech strength, the tech specific strengths, which is really more uh, about not only software and services, but those hardware names, the communications equipment names, the semiconductors names, the areas of the of the index that are really traditional tech that are subject to an inventory cycle are the areas where, unfortunately, valuations are still a little bit overpriced. Earnings weakness is emerging, has emerged over the last year, certainly with an inventory crisis that has emerged, but is likely reaching uh, more critical uh, critical levels. Mm. And I, frankly, I think the investor base is really captivated by the idea of a cycle, and in particular with Apple and Microsoft, really being able to shrug off risks fast, quickly, and recover quickly. Yeah. And that's the notion that we're going to really question over the course of the next earnings season is how much of this is a short-term weakness versus a long-term weakness? How rapidly can these companies start to recover strength into 2024? Mm. That is likely to frame, I think, the outlook for these stocks. And how many times could they mention artificial intelligence to get people yeah. excited? Gina Martin-Adams, we thank you so much of Bloomberg Intelligence. Meanwhile, coming up, we were just talking about it, that plunge in PC shipments. We're going to dive into that data. Ryan Reeves with us of IDC Group. Is it pandemic-driven surge cooling? Is it the consumer ed? Yeah, I want to go back to Micron as well because it feeds into the story, the memory chip glut we've been talking about. Shares up 8%, biggest jump in almost three weeks. It goes back to Samsung on Friday saying they're going to cut production of memory chips to a meaningful level, take some of that glut out of the market because the demand's not there. That's what we're talking about here. Micron higher 8%. This is Bloomberg. IDC out with its latest report showing PC demand is plunging, with Apple, for example, seeing a more than 40% decline in shipments year over year in the first quarter. Joining us now, IDC Group Vice President for Consumer Device Trackers, Ryan Reith. And Ryan, you know, Apple is the kind of headline here, but across the industry, we're back below early 2019 levels for shipments. What is the principal cause? Uh, really, demand slowed. Good to talk to you guys, by the way. Um, it's nice Likewise. to be on again. But, um, uh, honestly, it's really a demand story at this point. You know, I think, um, you know, the way we're looking at the entire market is we're basically at a, a correctional standpoint. And the correction is not just going to be this Q1 that we just put out a report this morning. Realistically, the, the correction is going to be uh, probably most of this year or the industry sees some growth around PCs. But um, so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at at this stage. Yeah. It's not a supply issue. It's not... Anything there, it's really a demand issue. And Ryan, the reasoning behind the demand issue, is it that, well, some of these computers haven't been upgraded of late, we're still anticipating Apple to do that in the second half of the year, everyone already over-indexed on purchasing them, or is it actually, we're now worried about our finances, we don't want to make big purchases? Uh, I th it's probably more the latter. I think it's, uh, you know, you've got, sorry about that, I just bumped the table here. Um, you've got the... You know, you've got the ongoing, you know, inflation concerns that are rising cost of goods already. You know, the global recession fear has not gone away. Uh, it's been tempered a little bit in some regions. So I think it's probably more the latter that uh, both consumers, companies and, and education institutions are sort of holding on to their purse strings a little bit tighter than they would. And it, and it makes sense. And I, I think a lot of the industry from supply chain all the way up to the OEMs, they they foresaw this coming. Yeah. Uh, I think the question was really what's the magnitude going to be and nobody wanted to you know over sort of correct on the downside because they didn't want to miss an opportunity like many did throughout mm -hmm. the pandemic so I think we're at that point now where you're gonna you know we already heard a little bit from Samsung uh, around memory but you know we've got some really important tech earnings coming up in the next couple of weeks which you guys know yeah. uh, very well I, I think we're gonna start to hear a little bit more probably gonna hear a little bit more um, 
you know, the storm's not over more so than the positives. But, I, you know, I, I, I just want to sort of just preface by sort of saying that we still believe that, you know, we get into next year that we're, we're going to be at, at or a little above pre-pandemic level. So there is some positive in all this, but we're going to hear some negativity, not only from what we put out today, but realistically probably for the next couple of quarters. And Ed, I mean, we already heard the warnings. The CFO of Apple himself, Luca, was saying we're going to right. see double-digit declines in the Mac part of the business, but it's not just Apple being affected. Yeah, and, and we were saying earlier, Ryan, you know, how much is your data set a crystal ball ahead of earnings season? But I wonder if we can actually get even more granularity, right? It's not Apple. You look at Dell, greater than 30% decline, HP, greater than 24%. Is there any geographic or demographical breakdown that you can see real pullback from the consumer? Yeah, uh, it, it, well, it's happening across the board. I would say the pullback that we're seeing now, the shift, is probably more angled towards the developed markets in the last six months. And the reason for that is because more of the developing markets around the world um, had already sort of corrected for consumer pullback, um, you know, hit a little bit harder on, on the wallet and, and so forth. And, and businesses sort of followed in um, sort of in that same segue, meaning you know, businesses in these emerging markets sort of said, hey, look, if we needed a PC, maybe we could do another six months without buying that PC, or if people were gonna refresh every five years, maybe we can get them to six years now, and that sort of prolongs the cost. So it, it, again, I know developed market versus emerging market doesn't really sort of break down the geographies, but you know, I think when you look at things, um, you know, our expectation is that uh, you know, the, the North American market has still been doing good in comparison to the global market. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've seen pockets of, again, I use the, the word strength uh, very lightly because it's really not strength, but a little bit better sort of opportunity in some of the European markets. China's seeing a little bit of recovery, going to take a little bit more time there, especially on the consumer side. So it, it's really spread out, but it's it's probably hitting uh, the pullbacks in the, the developing markets a little bit more just because of cost. Ryan Reith, great breakdown. Thank you of IDC Group. And he led us there. He started talking about China and the demand from that country. Let's stick with Apple and, in fact, its relationships with China. And you know that it's one U.S. business that's facing some of the steepest challenges, shall we say, to selective decoupling, as it's been called, from China. It's a key lawmaker, has been saying after a series of meetings with executives and experts in Hollywood and Silicon Valley over the last week or so, Let's go for more on this from Bloomberg's Economics, Tom Orlick. And Tom, we're talking about Mike McGallagher in particular, discussing this selective decoupling. What does he mean exactly? So uh, we've got Mike Gallagher, uh, the chair of a new House committee um, on U.S.-China relations, heading over to California, uh, meeting with Tim Cook of Apple, we meeting with um, uh, Bob, uh, Bob, Bob Iger of Disney, um, and um, talking about this concept of selective decoupling. Um, now, the idea here is that there are some aspects of the U.S.-China relationship which are strategically important. Most here in Washington, D.C., for example, don't want China to get the edge in artificial intelligence, and that's why there's now a ban in selling China the leading-edge semiconductors which are required to do leading-edge AI work. Um, other parts of the relationship, though, snapping together iPhones, watching Disney movies, cooperating on climate change, there's a desire to keep those relationships on an even keel. Um, the big question, of course, is, well, in practical terms, for a company like Apple, for a company like Disney, what does that selective decoupling look like? And is it, in fact, possible to have intense competition, yes. intense rivalry over here, but normal relationships over there? Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economics, who, of course, Caroline, spent many years in China at the heart of that economy, so knows both sides. All right, coming up, we're going to talk Tesla, which is building a large new battery factory in China, in Shanghai, further cementing China's place at the top of the global energy storage supply chain. More with that next. Sickum of the world of Musk, Twitter has changed its description tag for NPR to government-funded media from state-affiliated media. Following criticism last week, you probably saw this one, the company rewrote the label on Saturday following pushback from NPR, which hasn't used the platform itself since April 4th. NPR's CEO had called the state-affiliated media label, quote, unacceptable. This is Bloomberg.
Time now for Talking Tech. OpenAI setting its eyes on Japan. The co-founder and CEO, Sam Altman, who's here. He says the organization is looking at opening an office there and expanding Japanese language services after meeting with the country's prime minister. Let's move to Uber now because its Middle East unit is selling a 50% stake worth 400 million in its Kareem Super app to Emirates Telecom. Now that's an Abu Dhabi based firm trying to reinvent itself as a global tech investor. And Tesla will build a large new battery factory in Shanghai. The EV maker will manufacture those mega packs, those large scale energy storage units in the new facility, adding to its factory for EVs in the area. And Ed, you're going to talk about that more. Yeah, I've got Dana Hall, who covers all things Tesla, for us here in San Francisco with me on set. You and I always talk about when we, we're trying to report out these things, it's not a surprise. Elon Musk has always said, long term, we need more gigafactories all over the world. But this one's quite interesting because it's in China. Yeah, I mean, Tesla is really doubling down on its investment in China at a time when, it, like, tensions between Washington and Beijing are kind of at an all-time high. And uh, this is not super surprising. At Investor Day last month, Tesla talked about the energy transition. They've always made it very clear that they are more than a car company. Um, you know, for years, energy storage took a backseat to the cars, but now we're seeing Tesla talk a lot more about en the energy storage products. Uh, a lot of news from Tesla over holiday weekend, which often happens. They cut prices again in the United States. Where okay. and how and why? So they uh, changed the prices on their website late Thursday night. Friday is a market holiday. Uh, cut the X, the X and S quite a bit. Uh, shim, you know, shivved off some prices of the of the three and the Y. Musk has said that they're going to chase volume over margins, and uh, I don't know if investors are super thrilled with that. But I mean, he's made it very clear that in the short term, this is the way to go. We saw prices rise up quite a bit because of the chip shortage. Now they're coming back down, and he's determined to maintain that pole position, and he's going to cut prices to move move volume. All right, Bloomberg's Dana Hole, who leads our coverage of all things Elon Musk, all things Tesla. Caroline. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about well, chips that go into things like Tesla's and many more products. TSMC, we're going to discuss how the Taiwanese company's missed sales estimates for the second consecutive quarter. It's all about global demand for electronics remaining pretty weak. More on that next as we see TSMC currently off by 2.5% in terms of its ADRs and trading today. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. We've got some thin trading, to be honest, amid the holiday weekend. But most major equity indices lower. A lot of trading driven around Fed bets and Nasdaq 100 off by a percentage point. Also, the U.S. listed shares of China Tech down more than one and a half percent, sort of underperforming the market. Where there's outperformances in the chips... Look at the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, up 8 tenths of 1%. When you look at the individual movers, Caroline, you kind of understand why it's the memory chip makers really pushing higher, significant single-digit gains that are dragging up that index, all after Samsung said on Friday that it was going to cut production of memory chips to a meaningful level, take some of that supply glut out of the market. Where there is weakness is TSMC, which, as you know, mm -hmm. over the weekend said that it essentially has had its second consecutive quarterly sales miss against expectations, but how quickly things have changed in this sector from supply glut to no demand, what is going on? Yeah, and ultimately the self-prescriptions that are going on at Samsung cutting its production and TSMC actually cutting its capital expenditures. Let's dig in with Joanne Feeney, partner, portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management, who really we look to you for the expertise in the chip sector right now, Joanne, because should we have expected all of this? Yeah, Caroline, Ed, good to see you. You know, the challenges that the chip industry are facing look like they are coming to an end, which is the good news. The cuts at Samsung for manufacturing capacity is always part of a big bust boom cycle in the memory chip world. We're seeing that play out. But the Apple and TSMC news, you know, has some people wondering just how far down the PC sales are going to go and how long that part of the world is going to take to recover. And this becomes circular in a way, Ed. Oh, we kicked off the conversation of today really discussing some of the Apple issues, the fact that they're seeing a slowdown in PCs that just is highlighting the electronics demand that diminishes and ultimately that hits chips. 
I think, Joanne, this is where it's hard to, to understand what's going on, right? Is this a demand issue for the end market? Memory chips go into PCs, other consumer electronics. Is this uh, chip customers going through inventory and that there is a supply gap? What, for you, is the single biggest factor right now that's hurting the chip makers? You know, if for those exposed to the consumer, uh, PCs and smartphones, it's certainly a demand decline, right? After the surge in purchases during the worst of the pandemic, Right, we're seeing them digest that and wait till they need to upgrade their PCs or their smartphones. So I, I think demand is largely driving what's going on both at Apple and TSMC and had already gone on at the other PC manufacturers. The latest data from IDC just confirms that you know Apple's higher priced PCs are now seeing that same kind of drop off. And don't forget, we also saw news recently that Apple was cutting its uh, demand for chips out of TSMC, particularly the newest chip, the M2. And that, you know, was also a signal of what this was likely to be for them for the first quarter. You've, uh, you've taken us there to next generation technology. The first thing that Caroline thinks of, Joanne, when she wakes up <laughs> is artificial intelligence. And when she goes to sleep, artificial intelligence is all any of us think about at the moment. But in the chip sector, that's what's driving sales right now. You look at NVIDIA as the kind of prime beneficiary of that. Is that an area that excites you as an investor? Yeah, Ed, you've just bridged to the exciting area of the chip world, which is high performance computing, the generative AI. And don't forget, there's also a broader demand for chips out there in industrial applications and medical care applications. So while we do see right the PC and smartphone space in a demand driven decline and, and all the inventory problems that came along with that, we continue to see uh, secular that is multi year growth in the other areas of a more advanced chip demand, like for NVIDIA chips, like for servers, we know data centers are continuing to expand. We have all this traffic running across the internet, and now all of this demand for really high intensity computation driving the demand, for, for example, for NVIDIA chips. So one has to look more broadly at the, at the chip space and not just focus in on the PCs, which we know they're in cyclical decline, but there are plenty of opportunities for companies to continue to grow through those other areas. I have to say, Ed, it's a family affair, and my husband did all of the Easter egg hunt clues this weekend via ChatGPT and nearly blew my mind. But talk to us, Joanne, I mean, about, aside from the excitement of artificial intelligence, there was some hope, some silver linings coming from, for example, IDC saying some of this pullback means maybe TSMC and the like start to get where they manufacture in order as we start to see a bifurcated world of China versus the US, but also that things are going to pick back up in 2024. Yeah, I think that's fair. And one of the things we've been looking at as a potential positive driver for these markets, in addition to you know eventual uh, stabilization and ultimately cuts in interest rates, which will help these higher growth stocks to recover as they have been right since late last year, the next thing to come, we do believe, is going to be a recovery in earnings outlooks for the second half of this year and in 2024. And you know, you saw that Micron report, and it was terrible. But yet they said, hey, we're looking at the end of this inventory clearing cycle. Things are going to get better. And so I think that ultimately the tech investor is recognizing that cyclical declines are temporary. We're probably at the worst it's going to get. Probably see companies come out with you know, almost terrible earnings here for the first quarter and mm -hmm. cautious guidance. But they're probably going to point beyond that and say, yeah, this is a cyclical decline. We still have these structural drivers. Let's everybody look forward to that because these companies still have a lot of earnings power and earnings growth ahead of them once we get through the cyclical decline. And Ed, these are companies that have to think for the very long term, particularly when they think yes. about R&D. Well, I like the point that you made about where they manufacture. Sorry, Joanne, because I was just, you know, one thing we haven't talked about recently is the CHIPS Act. You know, you have Intel trying to, you know, reinvent itself on the foundry side, but also TSMC looking at Arizona. As an investor, is there an opportunity to put your money among those names that are due to get public money support, right, is what's happening in the CHIPS Act, the rethink on production and supply chain? You know, I think that's going to be a relatively minor driver of the stocks. It certainly gives Intel a lifeline to get it past this uh, technology, you know, stumbling block they've gone over, gives them time potentially to get into the foundry business. We're not so excited about that name in particular. For the other ones, though, what you can expect from these subsidies is ultimately a decline in the depreciation that they'll have to take against these new factories. And that should help sustain their margins. That's a good thing, but it wouldn't drive our investment 
uh, thesis overall. We'd still want to look to see whether they have a, a leading edge in the chips they're producing or designing and whether they're serving the right markets, the ones that are really growing. So I wouldn't use that as a real driver of an investment yeah. thesis at this point, but it should help sustain some margins. And one company, of course, we were shining light on the companies that do well on the day, the Microns, because Samsung's going to pull back in terms of its supply, Joanne. But I remember speaking to the CEO of Micron, who a year or so ago was saying, boom, bust cycles, they're over. We're in it for the long term. We're going to see IoT, we're going to see autos, and we're going to have this perpetual need for chips. That doesn't seem to ever work out. <laughs> that was the great hope. And we heard it from many companies, <laughs> from Texas Instruments to Micron to others. I think, though, we have to take a little bit of a step back, recognize two things. One, it is the case that the demand and the use of chips is far more diverse now than it was the case in you know, the 1990s and the first decade of the 2000s. What, what, is, what happened to disrupt that whole thesis that chip demand was more diversified and therefore there'd be less of these cycles, which in the past had really been driven by the PC and when the new chip came out. What happened was we hit a pandemic and the pandemic coordinated the purchases by lots of companies and lots of people of new PCs and new smartphones. And now we're seeing the backside of that where they're now pausing since they just bought a bunch of new stuff and they're waiting. We didn't expect to see that kind of a shock to the PC and smartphone cycle that really probably only came about because of the pandemic. I think once we get beyond this, I think that more diversified and market dynamic will come back into place and we'll see much smoother cycles going forward for the chip industry as a whole. Joanne Feeney, partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management. Someone, Caroline, that on the research and investing side has covered that sector for a long time. And it's interesting to get the kind of real time views on that news reaction from an investor's perspective. Now, coming up, betting on real world industries to redefine the next decade of tech. We're going to be joined by Eclipse founding partner, Leo Susan, for more on that next. Cara. Yeah, and let's just check in on what's happening in the world of crypto. There was this key story, if you're following the FTX fallout, well, the debtors, they've just been releasing their first report since the collapse. And it doesn't paint a pretty picture, unsurprisingly. Now, the report says that the company lacked fundamental financial and accounting controls, stifled dissent within the company, and that top members even joked internally about their tendency to ooh, lose track of millions of dollars in assets. Former CEO Sam Bankman-Fried faces trial in October after pleading not guilty to fraud and campaign finance law charges. Let's just check in, though, on the broader crypto scene right now, because Bitcoin, the strength still there. We're at 28,000, 28 and a half thousand now. And even ETH getting a little bit of a buy despite strength in the US dollar today. We're all thinking about Wednesday. We're all thinking about the Shanghai, the up ongoing nature of a move from proof of work to proof of stake with Ethereum. And well, some of the unstaking of some of those 18 million Ether that have been locked up for a few years. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Have private markets become a victim of their own success? That's what new research from Bloomberg Intelligence would suggest. As a surge in fundraising more than doubled in recent years during the era of low rates, this environment created, created some perverse incentives for valuations, right? As cash, rich firms chase deals. BI analysts in a note published today say they now expect institutional investment in private equity and venture capital to cool off as restructuring, markdown, slowing dry powder for deals and rising interest rates force basically a reevaluation of that risk reward equation. Now, there are some firms out there that are still raising money, powering through with new funds. Silicon Valley firm Eclipse just raised $1.2 billion for two new funds, both dedicated to backing startups, Caroline, that are trying to modernize physical industries. Fund five will focus on early companies, while early growth fund two will back more mature companies. Delighted to say that Eclipse founding partner, Leo Susan, joins us now. This is interesting. You want to back startups that make stuff, actual physical stuff. Why? Why is that so appealing to you? Uh, because, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, folks. And, you know, Ed, it's because it's matter. Uh, and the end of the day, we live in the physical world. Uh, 75 trillion out of the 100 trillion dollar, it's industries that are physical. And those industries did not have the same digital transformation that we are so familiar 
in the world of internet and so etc. We want to uh, digitizing those industries uh, because I think it's matter and because I think the impact from financial point of view is going to be tremendous. Leo, there's a, there's a name at your firm familiar to me, Charlie Mwangi, who was an executive at Rivian. And that got me thinking about your strategy. A lot of the areas you're looking at require scale and they're very capital intensive. Does that make them more risky as a VC investment? You know, Ed, that's actually kind of was the perception. Uh, the reality is to technology reached a point right now that you actually don't need the same amount of capital you needed before because I, you just guys talked about semiconductor. I can use semiconductor off the shelf. I can use contract manufacturing off the shelf. I can use the same open source and cloud infrastructure that our friends in the area of internet is being developed. And I can apply that in the physical world meaning the cost of capital and the needs for capital went down dramatically and the upside is a 75 trillion. So what we are seeing is a new area of opportunities for new founders to come and change the industries that matter. You know, Caroline, what's so fascinating, we're talking on a daily basis about artificial intelligence, software, Web3, again, software. Now, there must be a chunk of investors out there that are interested in getting into physical assets, physical companies building real stuff. Even though at the moment, for a lot of institutional investors, you were just saying it's a time to rethink your allocation to private markets. Exactly. And therefore, Leo, how hard or indeed easy was it to raise money? What, what do the LPs look like? Yeah, we, we raised money from a uh, uh, non-profit institution in the United States. Uh, that will be our endowment, uh, foundation, pensions, hospital system. Uh, I probably need to say right now, oh, it was really easy. We did it in two months. We were oversubscribed. All of the things that probably other VCs will say, that's true, but that's actually not the point. Uh, the point is we are seeing some of the most amazing founders right now in the market wants to be Elon Musk's. They yeah. want to go cars. They want to build rockets. They understand that the impact of technology can be much more superior in the physical world than what we being trained in Silicon Valley. It's all about SaaS. It's all about recurrent revenue. That's just not true anymore. Where are these founders that you're seeing? This is not a Silicon Valley thing. Uh, you need agriculture in China and you need logistics in uh, Austin, Texas. You need manufacturing in Berlin and you need industrial systems in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is a global effort to take uh, the industries that are powering our life and digitizing them. And I'm telling you that some of the smallest people right now are not doing anymore only crypto or SaaS or enterprise software. They are taking the long roads to go and build companies that will matter and that will move the economy into a digital phase. Leo, you referenced China. So you, you do plan to take some of your funds raised from US-based investors to deploy into startups that are based in China. We are 100% focused at today in the United States. Uh, we are all based in uh, Palo Alto, uh, 30 of us, and we are fo focusing on investing in the domestic area. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we are spending most of our time on onshore manufacturing, semiconductors, batteries, uh, defense systems that are very domestic oriented. And this is currently where is our focus on. But that's not mean that there is no opportunities in China. Real quickly, or there is one company that's looking for some money, and that company is Virgin Orbit. First of all, are you interested in, in investing in Virgin Orbit? And second of all, how do you do due diligence on the physical space? How hard is that? So we are all operators that operate in those industries, from Tesla, Rivian, Apple, Samsara, Flex, GE, and many others. And that's kind of, I think, what brings us the edge to be able to not only diligence in those companies when they have two guys in a presentation, maybe a dog, uh, but also to help them building when they are scaling into commercialization and then hopefully into the public market one day. Uh, on the Virgin, I will uh, politely pass. Oh, Eclipse founding partner, Leo, you've been so fruitful in all the rest of your answers. We thank you for, for politely deciding not to answer, Leo, Susan. We thank you very much indeed. Meanwhile, coming up, so much more to talk about. Two prominent US lawmakers, in fact, asking for answers over the failed Silicon Valley Bank relationships with its closest customers. We'll have more on what they demand to know from those in the VC fact space. Will they be politely 
ignoring mm -hmm. certain ones too. And as we head to break, let's just take a quick look at First Republic right now. Interesting story just across the Bloomberg about the federal home loan bank system issuing just 37 billion in debt in the last week of March. A sharp drop off from the 304 billion two weeks earlier. So we know that perhaps some of the banking crisis is subsiding, but for FRC, for First Republic, they've got some problems. They've got shares dipping after they suspended a quarterly cash dividend on some of the preferred stock. That basically means that they're seeing stress within their system. Their earnings release date, that's been pushed back too. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Elizabeth Warren and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are demanding answers over Silicon Valley Bank's close relationships with some of its customers. Now, in letters sent Sunday and reviewed by Bloomberg, the Democrats are asking 14 of the largest depositors with SVB about the nature of their connections with the bank, including look, whether board members, executives, investors, when they received special benefits, such as lines of credit from SVB. Well, Hannah Miller wrote that story. We're very pleased to welcome her to the show. And anyone responding to these letters so far? Yeah, so far, I've only heard back from Roblox, uh, so we haven't seen many responses come through yet, but it'll be interesting to see whether these companies choose to answer these letters, and if they don't, what Warren and AOC will say. You know, Hannah, I will never forget that weekend, the Saturday and Sunday following Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. You and I were working together, right, and we very quickly learned that actually, many, in many cases, pot depositors did use other services for the bank. What is that the kind of crux of what Warren is trying to find out here? Yes. So Silicon Valley Bank was just this cherished institution among venture capitalists and tech startup founders. And they had a wide, wide range of services. You know, you could go to them for your own personal finances as well as those for your company. So the contagion here <laughs> that was felt when SVB collapsed was really widespread. Mm -hmm. And at, Warren and AOC want answers as to whether these personal relationships that SVB had with founders and VCs actually contributed to its collapse. It's interesting that they're going to a lot of the big, now public companies for these sorts of answers. Is the real end person they're trying to label here the VC community? I think they are targeting the VC community. I mean, both Warren and AOC have been extremely outspoken and critical about what happened with SVB. Uh, there are concerns here that, you know, SVB was so willing to provide short-term funding, you know, that it may have contributed to instability um, at the bank. So they're, they want a closer look. They want to see how, you know, SVB coddled its clients. I think that was the word mm -hmm. that Warren used. So it's uh, very interesting to see how this will play out. All right, Bloomberg's Hannah Miller, thank you very much for your reporting. Now, we've been talking about it, and it's going viral. The Super Mario movie. It just topped the box office, and it's the biggest opening weekend for a film so far this year. Super Mario was released on Wednesday to take advantage of the spring break and Easter holidays. And over the five-day period, it took in $205 million domestically, according to Comscore. And with a global haul of $378 million, it's the biggest opening of any movie so far in 2023. Is that out in Japan yet? That was delayed there, wasn't it? That's the big question. Delay, because it's a tough crowd to please. And still they rake in all of that money globally. Quite astounding. Have you watched it? I haven't, but I will. Okay. I might, I might wait until it's more for a family affair, but great amount of focus on that. I didn't even get to ask you, though, Ed, whether you've picked up your Fire Festival 2 tickets. Well, I, have not, I wish we had <laughs> got this in. I haven't picked up my Fire Festival 2 tickets, but that is certainly something that's talked about on Twitter right now. Don't worry, we'll go and do a little video for social media. Come follow us at Bloomberg Technology. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of the show, Bloomberg Technology. Yeah, it was packed. Big focus on markets and chips. You can recap on the podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, Bloomberg, wherever you get your podcasts. From New York, from SF, this is Bloomberg.